Woof, to quote Lord Flashheart, here we go. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your author, Nate, and here we are with another chapter of The Adventures of Harry Potter, year one. Super excited this week because A, I'm over my sinus issues, as you can probably tell, and B, I've figured out how to get rid of room noise. Yay! Um, this is yeah, all a learning process for me starting out, So, and I'm a one-man operation. Uh, this is all very unprofessional at this point, so thanks everyone for putting up with my probably kind of weak first attempts at all this. Um, I won't need as much of an intro this week, as this chapter is a much longer one than the last one, and most of what I talk about with it is going to be in the behind-the-scenes section following after for the patrons over on Patreon. Please consider joining. It helps me pay the bills so I can focus on writing and creating other content for you all, and I think at only like $1 a month is my low-end asking. I don't think that's entirely unreasonable. Um... In other news, I fi should finally have a truck tonight that's fully functioning for the first time since October. Jesus Christ, this has been a long and expensive haul. Let's see, in the past year, I've replaced now, we just replaced the transmission, and last fall, we replaced the entire exhaust system. So, at this point, I almost go, would it have been better to just have bought a new freaking car? But, um... Either way, I guess finally the truck is fully functioning and working now, so my brother and I, my poor brother, won't have to share his car with me anymore. Um, and other and uh, much worse news, though, um, I know some of you know about this, but uh, my grandmother and only remaining grandparent is in the hospital, and looks like it's going to be for some time she's she's gonna make it but it's a rocky road not just for her health but also for um, her very way of life going forward from here um, grandma Mary has always been a really strong presence in uh, my family's life and in my life and you know she's a smart loving and very independent person um, and the latter part of that is going to take a pretty heavy blow after this. Um, though, yeah, nearly losing her the other week was a big blow to the family. Um, so we'll take any thoughts and things like that for her improved health going forward. Um, I'm also working a bit more on my setup so I can use my laptop to read from and record and all that because uh, the keys on my gaming keyboard and the clicking slash scrolling of my game mouse... Uh, are a wee bit too loud, so I shouldn't have to use those as I record anymore. Um, so that won't be nearly as distracting, um, which is going to be better for all you guys, hopefully. Um, now i got to talk about format a bit more here. Um, I'm going to start trying to do two episodes a week. Um, first episode of each week, probably Tuesday uploads, will be AHP and AHP related. Um, Second upload, probably Thursdays or Fridays, uh, will be more of a free-for-all, and it will be about things like history I find interesting, historical context, mythology, um, you know, writing in general, tips for writing, um, and maybe me reading some of my other writings and not necessarily fictional ones. Um, but anyway, so this will mean everyone's going to get a steady weekly filling of AHP and other content as it comes along. Um, I mean, come on, we... We all know you're here for the AHP anyway. Um, <laughs> um, oh, and another formatting thing, um, not editing editing uh, mistakes and slip-ups and stuff for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, I just don't really have the time to devote to stopping, editing, you know, cutting, re-recording, all that stuff. Um, maybe if this takes off more and I don't have a, my normal job to do as much for income, I can focus more on that. But until then... Yeah, we're just going to be rolling with the punches. Um, for two, I just need reading practice anyway, reading aloud, um, you know, things like that. So, yeah, because of that, we're also just going to roll with it, Dan. Thirdly, I don't know, this just feels more natural, I think. These are more, you know, I, I see these more as me kind of like reading, you know, bedtime story kind of thing to my readers than, you know, not really making real audiobooks or things like that. Maybe if, again, maybe I can make that a Patreon goal if, uh, you know, this takes off a little bit more, making actual audiobook recordings for, um, 
you know, maybe put on Audible or something, you know, eh, who knows. Um, now then, without any further ado, to continue the cliche, well, let's begin with Chapter 2. The Adventures of Harriet Potter, Year 1, Chapter 2, The First Train Ride. The key to friendship is acceptance and understanding. You must accept that no one is perfect, not even yourself. But before you can accept, you must understand what makes others and yourselves the way you all are. And once that is achieved, you can weather any storm with them. General retired Jigme Dorji Wanshuk. Meanwhile, back inside King's Cross, Harriet watched in disbelief as the Dursleys walked away, laughing hysterically. She looked around anxiously, wondering what to do. There were guards about, but every one of them looked agitated and standoffish, and she didn't feel like pestering them. She looked at the big clock on the wall, feeling antsier and antsier. She didn't have much time left. She'd have to ask someone. Maybe, just maybe that violin player outside the station would know how to find the platform. He was probably here a lot, perhaps he'd heard of it before. No, he'd sounded so disapproving of her being alone when she'd walked over to him before. But maybe he'd seen the Dursleys leave too, and would know she was now alone. Then she remembered how Uncle Vernon had brought out a guard to shoo the man away after they'd gotten into the station. That meant he wouldn't be there anymore. Finally, she made up her mind and walked around to and walked over to a guard who looked not quite as busy as the rest. Excuse me, sir. She started tugging on his sleeve. He looked around confused before looking down and seeing her. His irritated and gruff demeanor vanished instantly as he smiled. Yes, dear? What may I do for you? He asked, giving a quick look around as if looking for her parents. Well, I'm, I'm supposed to get on a train on platform nine and three quarters, she explained nervously. The guard's smile faded. He looked at her with a furrowed brow. Nine and three quarters? He asked, confused. There is no platform nine and three quarters. Who told you that? It, it's on my ticket, sir. She went on, looking up at the guard nervously. He furrowed his brow, looking around again. Are you here alone? Harriet nodded. Who brought you here? Your parents? Harriet opened her mouth to explain when suddenly she felt a hand on each of her shoulders. There you are, you little scamp, said a boy's voice, starting to pull her away. Sorry, sir, she's our cousin. We're from up north, and she's coming to stay with us for her schooling. We were meeting up here to take her home with us, said another boy's voice. Harriet looked over her right shoulder to see a tall, red-haired boy smiling at the guard innocently. She looked over her other shoulder and blinked, seeing the same boy standing there, too. She looked back and forth again before realizing it was a pair of identical twins. The twin who had just spoken was pointing across the station to a family group, all of whom with flaming red hair. It was a sizable family, it seemed, five children, including the two who were holding her shoulder. They were three boys and two girls, standing around a plump woman who was giving the guard a kindly smile as she waved at him. The most reassuring sight, however, was the owl in the birdcage sitting on their luggage. They were witches and wizards, too. Harriet looked up at the guard who seemed a little reassured, but still had an air of skepticism as he returned his attention to Harriet. Is that your family? he asked. Harriet looked over, back over her shoulder and looked at the plump woman again. Her smile was warm and inviting, and she gave a soft nod. As Harriet turned to look at the guard still, she also caught the eye of one of the twins who gave her a surreptitious wink. She looked back at the guard and smiled. Oh, yes, sir, she said, trying her best to sound relieved. My aunt, and these are my cousins. I'm from out of town, too, she lied quickly. The guard looked the family over again. All right, miss. Glad your family found you. Have a good trip, all of you. He said and waved at the woman who waved back, smiling. The twins grinned as they led her back to the family. Well done, said the one on her right. Yeah, quick on, quick on the uptake. I like that, said the other twin, who also gave her a wink. I'm Fred, by the way, said the one on her right. And I'm George, said the other. And this is our mom, said Fred as they reached the family. The woman smiled warmly down at Harriet and gave her a quick one-armed hug. Hello, dear, said the woman in a sweet, motherly tone. She gave Harriet an odd feeling. It wasn't unpleasant, far from it. Just one she didn't find familiar. It was somewhat like the feeling Harriet would get stepping out into warm sunlight after a long time in her cupboard under the stairs. To her surprise... Harriet realized she felt safer and closer to these people than she'd ever felt with the Dursleys, and she'd only just met them. Your first time at Hogwarts? The woman asked in a concerned voice, and Harriet nodded. She patted Harriet's cheek softly. 
It's our Ronnie's first year, too, dear. Come with us, and we'll see you on the train. Oh, thank you, Harriet said, exhaling deeply. I've been trying to find the platform, but it's so busy, and I was told by my uncle and the guard over there that there is no platform nine and three quarters. She went on, feeling emotional from the relief and the situation as a whole. The woman smiled in a motherly way, patting Harriet's cheek again. It's quite all right, dear. Come with us. I'm Mrs. Molly Weasley, and this here's the eldest Percy, she said, patting the patting her hand on the shoulder of the tallest of the boys, who wore horn-rimmed glasses. He nodded down at her imperiously. Indeed, he slightly reminded Harriet of the owl that was sitting on top of the trunk he was pulling. And this is Fred and George, she said, moving on to the two twins who had already introduced themselves. They both nodded similarly to the way Percy had done, but their faces were much warmer and undoubtedly much more prone to laughter. Harriet smiled back at them. And here's our oldest girl, Ronnie, and our youngest, Ginny. Mrs. Weasley went on. Harry agreed to them both. Ronnie was tall for their age, and was wearing jeans with scuffed knees and had a smudge of dirt on her nose with shoulder-length, straight red hair that fell on her face. The younger girl, Ginny, seemed only a year younger than Harriet and Ronnie, and was looking back at Harriet with a warm, inquisitive smile. Ginny also wore old, second-hand clothes, though her hair was long and came almost to her waist. I'm Harriet, she said, smiling at them all. Mrs. Weasley beamed down at her and gestured towards the barrier between platforms 9 and 10. Well, my dear, this is the doorway here, hidden to the muggles. Ronnie, it's your first time, too. Why don't you and Harriet go together? Take a run at it, dears. Don't be afraid of crashing into it, she added in afterthought. Harriet lined up her trunk next to Ronnie's. She felt a little foolish, about to run into a solid brick wall. Ronnie smiled at her somewhat smugly. I've done this before more than a few times. Just keep right by me and keep going, Ronnie said reassuringly. Ronnie counted down from three, and together they started. Harriet ran, pushing her trolley as best she could while trying to keep pace with the taller girl beside her. The barrier kept coming closer and closer. Finally, Harriet closed her eyes, waiting for the collision. It never came. The next thing Harriet knew, she felt Ronnie's hand on her arm, pulling her to a stop. She opened her eyes and at the same moment became aware of the entirely new cacophony of noise all around them. A steam whistle sounded, and cheerful voices filled the air. Owls hooted, cats meowed, frogs croaked, people laughed. The large steam engine before them was scarlet, and Harriet sighed in relief, seeing the words Hogwarts Express emblazoned on its side. Rennie grinned to her and turned, seeing the rest of the family making their way through. Well, here you are, dear, safe and sound and just in time. You'd better get your things on the train and start meeting your fellow students and making new friends, said Mrs. Weasley, beaming down at her. Harriet smiled back. Oh, thank you so much, Mrs. Weasley, Harriet replied. And Mrs. Weasley gave her another soft hug around the shoulder. Here, we'll help you with your trunk, said George eagerly, picking up, he picking up Hedwig in her cage. Hedwig clicked her beak aggressively. Er, I'll help with the trunk, Fred said, grabbing it up, though grunting and muttering, Blimey! under his breath as he tried to carry it by himself. George glowered at Fred a little and followed, still carrying Hedwig. Harriet looked up at Ronnie, who looked just as confused as she, and shrugged, and Her as she shrugged, and Harriet went off after them. Fred was forced to set her trunk down, and George put Hedwig back on top of it again. They lifted it together, carrying it onto the train for her, maneuvering it in and down the hall and into a compartment. They set Hedwig down on a seat, gingerly, and hoisted her trunk onto a rack for her. They paused in a self-satisfied way and smiled down at her. "'Well, there you are, milady,' said Fred, bowing deeply. "'A pleasure to have been of service,' said George, bowing even more deeply, drawing a scathing look from Fred. Harriet barely suppressed a giggle at them and smiled. "'Well, thank you both very much. You're my knights in, um, shining armor?' she said, feeling slightly ridiculous. Fred and George smiled in, if possible, an even more self-satisfied way. Well, if you need us, we'll be down the other end of the train. Come on, George. If we don't say goodbye, Mom will have a howler chasing down the train, said Fred, and they turned to leave. As they did, Harriet absentmindedly brushed her hair back from her right ear. George paused, noticing out of the corner of his eye. He did a double take and fell back against the wall in shock as if someone had shoved him. His reaction was so sudden that Harriet started and Fred stopped, looking confused before he before he too became dumbstruck. What? Harriet asked, bemused too at their reactions. Y your forehead! That, that scar! stammered George, 
still looking shocked, but now more amazed than aghast. Are you... You're Harriet Potter, aren't you? exclaimed Fred in awe. Harriet felt her face growing hot and knew she was starting to blush. I... well, yes, she replied. She felt anxious now like she had in the Leaky Cauldron and in Ollivanders that summer when the Hogwarts gamekeeper, a giant man named Rubius Hagrid, had taken her to Diagon Alley, a wizarding shopping district in London for her school supplies. Everyone had known who she was there as well. Fred and George continued to gawk, Harriet looking around a little nervously. Well, your, your family's waiting. I, I won't keep you, she said before ushering them out of the compartment. She shut the door and flopped down into one of the seats, heaving a sigh. Hagwood was right, she mumbled under her breath. Everyone does know my name. She looked out the window, but ducked as she realized the Weasley family was standing right below her. She felt her blush grow as she heard the twins rejoin the group. Mom! she heard Fred say. That girl we helped on the platform. Know who she was? Who? asked Mrs. Weasley, sounding distracted. Harriet Potter, said George. Immediately, the younger girl, Jenny, started talking. Harriet could almost picture her tugging at to her mom's sleeve in her excitement. She is? Jenny asked in a shrill voice. Mom, can I go see her? I want to... No, Jenny, said Mrs. Weasley, disapproving. She's not a circus attraction to be ogled. Is she really? she asked. How do you know? She told us, even showed us the scar, answered Fred excitedly. Oh, the poor dear, Mrs. Weasley went on, her voice full of concern. I wonder what she's doing here alone, and she was so polite, the poor thing. Do you think she remembers you know who at all, asked Fred. Immediately, Mrs. Weasley's voice changed to waspish outrage. I forbid you to ask her, Fred! And if she needs remind, as if she needs reminding of that on her first day at Hogwarts. Now, here, I've packed you all sandwiches. Be good, you two, she said in a dangerous tone. If I hear one word about your having blown up a toilet or... Blown up a toilet? We've never blown up a toilet, said George disgruntled. Great idea, though. Thanks, Mum, said Fred. She heard the sound of feet pattering away on the pavement and Mrs. Weasley calling after the twins. Harriet sighed, staring up at the ceiling as she heard the conductor slamming the doors of the train shut. She watched out the window as the train started to chug to life. Slowly pulling away from the platform... Ginny was running along the train, a little further back, waving and obviously crying before she ran on a platform and had to stop. Harriet sat back, trying to wrap her mind around all that had happened. She was going. She was going to Hogwarts, a school for people like her and no Dudley and his gang to antagonize her. The door to her compartment slid open, and Harriet looked to see Ronnie standing in the doorway. She looked embarrassed, glancing down the corridor before looking back at Harriet. Sorry, Ronnie said, looking anxious, but everywhere else is full. Could, can I join you? she asked. Harriet smiled and nodded. Ronnie looked relieved and took a seat opposite of Harriet, looking at her contemplatively. Are you really Harriet Potter? Ronnie asked abruptly, with the same air of skepticism in her voice that her mother had used. Harriet nodded. The scar and everything. Harriet just pulled back her hair to show Ronnie. Ronnie gasped with an open mouth. Wow. I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to sound all doubting. I just... Fred and George are sort of jokesters, so you kind of... Yeah, I got that impression, Harriet smiled. Is your whole family wizards? She asked, her curiosity at this obviously wizarding family, like she'd heard about, starting to win her over. Oh, yeah, Ronnie said in a bored tone. Well, I think I have an uncle who's an accountant, but we never talk about him. Is it true you were brought up by muggles? Yeah, my aunt and uncle. Harriet replied. What are they like? Horrible, Harriet answered. Well, my aunt and uncle are, but lots of muggles are nice. Like one of our neighbors, Mrs. Fig. She's a bit batty, and okay, I never really have much fun when I'm over there, but she really is nice all the same. Ronnie nodded, still seeming awestruck. So what's it like growing up in a wizarding family? Ronnie shrugged. It's all right. Not sure how to compare it. My family's huge. You only met part of my brothers. There's my eldest brother, Bill. He's already left Hogwarts, and now he's a curse breaker for Gringotts working in Egypt. My second eldest brother, Charlie, also left already. He's studying dragons in Romania. Dragons? Harriet exclaimed, starting to feel overwhelmed by the talk of dragons. Hagrid had spoken about wanting one as a pet that summer. Yeah, said Ronnie with an indifferent shrug. Then there's Percy, who you met. That's about as cheery as he ever gets. She muttered under her breath. 
and then there's Fred and George, of course. You called, little sis? Came Fred's voice from the doorway. The twins were back and grinned at Harriet. How well, nice to see you two found each other, said George. Should have known our butch little sister would make the real first move, Fred said in a taunting move that made Ronnie go red as her hair. Shut up, said Ronnie, getting up and starting to push them out. It was you two, Fred and George simply chuckled and ruffled her hair. Come on, little sis, we're just having some fun with you, Fred sighed. Yeah, said George. Anyway, just wanted to say if either of you needs us, we'll be down at the back end of the train. He's got a giant tarantula he's trying to smuggle in. See ya, Harriet. Run up. He started to say... He started to say one last taunt, but Ronnie gave a final shove and pushed both out into the corridor, slamming the door shut after them and dropping back into her seat, grumbling. Sorry about that, said Ronnie, brushing her bangs back out of her eyes. You should see my cousin, said Harriet, pointing her glasses with a cello-taped bridge. Ronnie looked with raised eyebrows. Did he do that? she asked, shocked. Why are such jerks? she grumbled, crossing her arms. Harriet twisted her mouth a little sympathetically before more curiosity overtook her. So, was he about to call you Ronald? Harriet asked, but regretted it immediately upon seeing Ronnie's face go bright red. Oh, well, long story. Anyway, yeah, that's Fred and George, she said, she said changing the subject rapidly. And you met Ginny, my younger sister. She and I get on pretty well. I mean, we're the only two girls after all, so we kind of stick together. Ronnie said before she sighed, looking out the window as the train moved along. I guess I've got a lot of live up to live up to. Bill was head boy, Charlie was captain of his Quidditch team, Percy's a prefect, while Fred and George cause a lot of trouble, but they're really popular and get good marks, so everyone loves them. But I'm the first girl in our family, so I feel like I have to do it all too. Ronnie went on, still looking out the window, though she suddenly looked back. It's not all bad, though. At least to get newer clothes. Fred and George have mostly had to get hand-me-downs, and though it does though it does make them a bit jealous sometimes, I think. I mean, I like them, but we don't get on much. I did get Percy's handed-down rat, though. Scabbers. Ronnie said and reached into her jacket pocket and pulled out a rat. If Harriet couldn't see him breathing, she'd have thought he was dead. He's useless, though. Just sleeps all the time. Ronnie stuffed the rat back in her pocket and sighed. Harriet sighed, too. I don't know. I guess I have a lot to live up to, too, but I don't really know what or how, really. Everyone seems to know me, and they say I'm famous, but I don't even remember what I'm supposed to be famous for. Ronnie looked up curiously. Nothing at all. No, said Harriet. Well, I remember a lot of green, but other than that, no, nothing. Not until Hagrid finally told me about all about being a wizard and uh, what happened to my parents and Voldemort, anyway, Harriet admitted honestly. At the name Voldemort, Ronnie let out a gasp and a squeak that Harriet didn't quite think suited her. Ronnie jumped so severely that her rat, Scabbers, hopped out of her pocket and down onto the seat, where he immediately fell asleep again. What? asked Harriet, her heart racing, Ronnie's reaction having also startled her. You said his name! Out loud! Who? Volda? Ronnie hissed a little, even at just the first syllable of the name so Harriet didn't finish the word. Sorry, stuttered Ronnie, looking both impressed and slightly terrified. I mean, you just think that you, out of anyone, would have the hardest time saying his name. Harriet merely shrugged. I don't know anything about the wizarding world, or any of the rules. I have so much to learn, I just... I just know I'm going to be awful at everything. Nah. Honestly, I probably don't know any more magic than you do. I mean, yeah, I've grown up, grown up seeing magic, but I've never actually been able to perform it. Why not? I mean, we're not allowed to do magic outside of school. And I only just got my wand anyway, she said and drew it out, examining it wearily. It's not new either. It's Charlie's old one. He just got himself a new one. Harriet nodded, trying to hide the fact that even someone from what was... Apparently an old wizarding family didn't know any more magic than she did cheered her up considerably. She returned her attention to the window and realized how far they had traveled in such a short amount of time. Harry took the time to ask Ronnie some questions, which Ronnie seemed only too happy to answer when she could. So where is Hogwarts exactly? Harry had asked. Ronnie shrugged. Don't know exactly. I mean, never been there before, have I, either? 
It's way up north, though. Train ride takes about eight and a half hours, I've heard. So it'd have to be in Scotland, I'd say. It has a lake by it, in the wild, miles away from muggles. Harriet nodded, absorbing the information. It's a great big castle, Harriet or Ronnie went on. Tall towers and gates and all that. Ghosts and other things all over. I've tried to ask Charlie the most about what it's like, because Percy's a know-it-all prat, and Fred and George, you can guess how reliable anything they tell you is. Harriet smiled and nodded. I've never seen a castle before. I've hardly ever even left Privet Drive where I grew up, except to go to school or zoos. Harriet muttered the last word, the memory of that odd and unpleasant day still uncomfortable. What are muggle neighborhoods like? Ronnie asked. Harriet shrugged. Boring. Proof of drive is, anyway. Little cookie-cutter houses that all look the same, all squished together with little matching gardens. What was muggle school like? Ronnie asked, becoming even more interested. Lousy, mostly because of my cousin. Biggest and meanest kid in the school, and he hates me, so naturally everyone else did, too. Ronnie scowled at that. Indeed, Harriet was quite sure Ronnie was complimenting how to reach all the way back to London and punch Dudley in the face. Harriet found herself amused that once again she was seeing herself being the one answering more questions than asking. Not sure what you want to know about muggles so much for, Harriet said amused. Ronnie shrugged and blushed. No, oh, Dad likes them. Okay, that's an understatement. He loves them. I guess in small ways it's caught on. Dad likes their gizmos and how they make things work without magic. Harriet nodded and smiled. Ah, okay. And here I am wondering how magical people possibly do anything without stuff like electricity. They giggled a little at this before the moment was interrupted as the compartment door slid open and a kind-faced witch peered in, smiling. Care for something from the cart, dears? she asked. Harriet, who hadn't eaten all day and now had a pocket full of coins, nearly sprang to her feet. Ronnie grimaced, looking at the bag of sandwiches her mother had given her, sitting, until then, forgotten beside her. I'm good, she muttered in an ever-suffering voice. Harriet had never been able to buy things like candy and snacks at the Dursleys. She had never had a friend to share anything with, either. Her pocket jingling, she stepped into the corridor and to look, to look at the cart. Her jaw fell open at the spectacle. The cart was overflowing, but not with the usual treats Harriet had to force herself not to stare at when Aunt Petunia took her to the grocer's. Instead, it was laden with sweets like birdie bots every flavor beans, cauldron cakes, chocolate frogs, and pumpkin pasties. Unable to choose, Harriet just took a bit of everything, paid the witch, and turned back into the compartment. Ronnie's eyes goggled at the sight of all the sweets. A bit peckish, maybe? Ronnie asked, sounding amused. I'm famished, Harriet replied as she dumped the food onto the seat. She picked up one of the pumpkin pasties and tore open the wrapper before taking a large bite. Ronnie, meanwhile, had opened the bag of sandwiches and grimaced again. All dry already. Here, have a pasty then. Harriet beamed, handing one over to Ronnie. Ronnie blushed brightly. Oh, no, that, that's all right. Oh, please take one. I've, well, I've never had anyone to share anything with before. Or anything to share, really. Ronnie looked as though she was still inclined to refuse, but her stomach won out and she relented. Before long, they were laughing and chatting as they tried everything. As they talked, Harriet felt warmer and happier than she'd ever felt in her life. And as she looked at the tall, red-headed girl sitting across from her, Harriet could not help but realize that, that she had, without even trying, just made her first real friend in her life. The snacks were as fun to investigate as they were to eat. Harriet was relieved to discover the fruit chocolate frogs were not in fact real frogs, and she had a lot of fun looking through the cards that came with them, which Ronnie said were collectible. Her first was the headmaster of Hogwarts, Albus Dumbledore, who gave Harriet a considerable shock by walking out of his picture on the card and back again a few minutes later. It amused Harriet that Ronnie was just as amazed when Harriet told her that in non-magical pictures, the subjects didn't move at all. Most fun, however, were the every flavor beans, which quickly turned into a game of dare, Harriet and Ronnie daring each other to try different colored beans to see what the flavor was. Ronnie was now explaining the rules of Quidditch, and all about her favorite team when the door to their compartment opened again, and a boy about their age walked in. He looked as though he's been crying, and didn't seem to see them clearly at first through his watery eyes. 
Excuse me, but have any of you seen a toad? The boy paused after wiping his eyes, and he seemed to finally register he was in a compartment with two girls, at which point his face immediately went scarlet, and he bolted from the compartment, not even shutting the door behind him. Harriet and Ronnie stared after him, utterly bewildered. Oh, that was... different, concluded Harriet with a nod. I wonder who or what he's looking for. No idea, said Ronnie with a shrug before getting up and sliding the compartment door shut again. She had barely sat back down when the compartment door flung open again and another girl stepped in with a round-faced boy from a minute ago in tow behind her. She was about Harriet's height but had thick bushy brown hair, brown eyes. Her two front teeth were somewhat more prominent than the others and she had already put on her robes. Have either of you seen a toad anywhere? Neville here has lost one, the new girl asked. Her tone was self-important and impatient, but not snooty. Oh, is that what you were looking for? Harriet asked, smiling at Neville while trying to sound polite, though he looked as though he wanted to fall through the floor of the train and disappear forever. Toad? Why would anyone want to find it if it's lost? Ronnie asked. Harriet shot a sideways glance at Ronnie, having thought the question a bit rude, given how upset Neville looked, but was surprised to see the innocent look on Ronnie's face. Well, I have my first best friend anyway, she thought. Tactless, but my friend. Harriet looked and saw the new girl had a somewhat disapproving look on her face as well. Well, I was only trying to help him, and I was only asking if you'd seen one, not your opinion of toads altogether, she said, her eyes finding scabbers. Though I see you have a rat, which is every bit as out of vogue, so I'm not really sure you have all that much room to talk. Ronnie's ears went pink, and she looked a little mollified. Sorry, she muttered. The new girl turned back to Harriet. I'm Hermione Granger. You must be Harriet Potter. I see your scar. Er, I... Yeah, Harriet said, feeling a bit of an ever-suffering tone in her voice as she brushed her bangs back down over the scar. I've read all about you, of course, the girl named Hermione went on. You're in a few of the extra books I got in Diagon Alley. Modern Magical History, The Rise and Fall of the Dark Guards, Great Wizarding Events of the Twentieth Century... I am? Harriet asked in astonishment. Oh, of course, Hermione exclaimed. How could you not be? So you were brought up by muggles. My parents are muggles. I didn't know anyone in my family was magic. Pretty much none of them are, except for one of my cousins in France, though I've never really seen her all that much. She's going to Beaubaton, which wouldn't really have been so bad to go to, or to Rathlin, though Rathlin's really exclusive, of course, and you have to have attended the primary school there to be eligible for the academy. But for all out magical schools, none of them come close to Hogwarts, especially under Professor Dumbledore. He's supposed to be the greatest wizard of our age, maybe of all time, after all. And he was a Gryffindor, too, which is the house I hope I get, though Ravenclaw wouldn't be so bad. Anyway, we better go off and find your toad, Neville. Without another word, or even a glance back, Hermione turned and dragged Neville back out of the compartment after her. Harriet and Ronnie stared after them for a moment. Well, she was certainly... Spirited, Harriet finished for Ronnie, trying to be polite. Er, yeah, that's the word for it. Ronnie said, though Harriet was more than reasonably sure that was not the word she was going to use. Harriet looked out the window again. The train was starting to move up some mountains, and she could just see the tracks of the train behind them as they rounded a corner. I reminded Harriet of something. So your brother Charlie, you said he works with dragons? Oh yeah, he's mental about them. Not that I blame him. I mean, they're fascinating, aren't they? Ronnie asked with a shrug. Harriet shrugged in return. I suppose, she replied sheepishly. It's just, I mean, growing up, I never heard about dragons all that much. Muggles think they're just out of fantasy stories. Now I feel like I've heard more about them in like the two or three days or so I've spent with other witches and wizards than I have my whole life. The school's gamekeeper, Hagrid, who took me to Diagon Alley, he, he said... They had them at Gringotts, even, and how much he wanted one as a pet. At the last comment, Ronnie choked a little on the chocolate frog she had just tried to swallow. Wanted one as a pet? He's mental! Dragons are dangerous. They're terrifying, dirty great lizards with spines and great big fangs and claws that fly and breathe fire. Well, Hagrid himself is about twice as tall as a normal person, Harriet shrugged. So if anyone could, could it looks like he could have be the one to handle one. Ronnie still shook her head in disbelief. She glowered at the door as it slid open yet again. 
This time, but this time, it was not the round-faced boy Neville or the bushy-haired Hermione. The boy was thin and pale-skinned, with nearly white blonde hair. Harriet had met this boy before, though she did not know his name. She met him in Diagon Alley in the robe-fitting shop. It was him who told Harriet that people from non-magical families shouldn't come to Hogwarts. She had disliked him from the start. This time he had two other boys with him, and instead of bored disinterest, he was looking at Harriet with almost hungry curiosity. So you're her, are you? Harriet Potter. Draco Malfoy muttered in a way that Harriet wasn't exactly sure if he was asking her or appraising her. Yes, yes I am, Harriet said. If she hadn't liked Malfoy's tone and look much back in Madame Malkin's, she definitely didn't like it now. She watched the boy's eyes move up to her forehead, squinting, trying to see her scar through her fringe, which was still covering it. Before moving down over the rest of her, too, the feeling made her shiver. Malfoy, Draco Malfoy, the boy said, extending a hand. Harriet didn't take it. She gave Ronnie a sideways glance and noted the look of distaste on her face as she appraised Malfoy and the other two boys. And who are these two gorillas? Ronnie asked gruffly. Malfoy turned his eyes to her. This is Crab and this is Goyle, said Malfoy dismissively as he turned his scrutinizing face to Ronnie. And you are... Weasley, Ronnie declared, glaring. Ronnie Weasley. Weasley, Malfoy said, seeing the name with much the same expression Ronnie had worn when she ate a sprout f every flavor bean earlier. So the family finally produced something other than a boy, did it? Well, at least that'll help save on food bills and housework, won't it? Malfoy said lazily. Ronnie's face went red with mingled rage and shock, and Harriet was quite sure hers had gone a similar shade. You see, Potter, if that's who you really are, there are good wizarding families and bad ones. Good wizarding families, like mine, have a proper pride in their lineage and place in the world. Other wizarding families, however, Malfoy muttered the last part under his breath and shot a sideways glance at Ronnie. Harriet felt her temper breaking. I can tell who good and bad wizards are all on my own, she said with a slight snarl that wiped the smirk off Malfoy's face entirely. You better watch that temper. They can get you into trouble, you know. Potter was a pureblood family until your mother. You should have proper pride, too, unless your mother truly did pollute that. Or maybe you aren't Potter after all. Crab, Goyle, check her for her scar, Malfoy ordered. Crab and Goyle stepped forward, and Harriet and Ronnie leapt to their feet. Harriet and Ronnie raised their fists, but at that moment, Crab's right knee buckled and he toppled to the floor with a crash. He rolled over, stupidly looking towards the door. The dress spun around as well. In the doorway, Harriet could see two more boys. They were both about the same height as Malfoy, but one had brownish-red hair and brown eyes, while the other had long, dark brown hair tied back in a ponytail and blue eyes. The brown-eyed one was putting some of his weight back on a club-headed walking stick, which he had apparently just jabbed Crab in the back of the knee. Both boys were glaring at Malfoy. Harriet saw Crab get back to his feet and take a step towards the boy with a stick, but Malfoy held out a hand to stay him. As Harriet watched, she saw Crab's eyes move to the other boy's face, the stick, and his leg, with an inexplicable smirk, when an inexplicable smirk spread across his otherwise gormless face. So, said the blue-eyed boy with a distinct Scottish accent. Think it's all right, <laughs> forcing your will on young lassies, eh? He growled. Aye, said the other boy, his Irish accent contrasting to his companions. It's a bit more gentlemanly to ask a lady when you have a request. And if she turns you down, it's just as gentlemanly to honor it. Malfoy looked at the two appraisingly, then back at Harriet and Ronnie, who had both drawn their wands rather than their fists. Outnumbered now, he seemed to think better of the situation. Crab, Goyle, come. This place stinks of blood traitors and muggle lovers now, he muttered, and they slouched off. Crab continuing to smirk at the boy with a walking stick as he made his way out. The blue-eyed boy turned to Harriet and Ronnie. Are you two okay? he asked concern. Harriet opened her mouth to reply when Ronnie cut in. We didn't need your help. We're not helpless little girls, she barked shortly. Harriet looked at her aghast as the boy took a step back, looking wounded. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend. We were just walking down the hall and wondered what Malfoy was saying. 
It had nothing to do with you two being girls, honest. Hi, would have done just the same had you been lads, said the boy with the stick. Ronnie did look a little abashed. Sorry, I didn't mean... Sorry, she muttered and sat down. The two boys seemed to collect themselves and smiled again. It's all right, said the blue-eyed boy. No harm was done, yeah? I'm Scott, Scott McIntyre, he said and held out a hand to Ronnie who shook it. Aye, and I'm Karen O'Brien, the other said, giving an awkward bow. So what did Malfoy mean by blood trait, Harriet started to ask before being cut off by the bushy-haired Hermione re-entering their now quite cramped compartment. What have you all been doing? You haven't been starting fights, have you? You're all going to be in trouble before we even start. Her I'm Hermione Granger, by the way, she said to Kieran and Scott, who smiled and introduced themselves to her in her return. And her, I'm Harriet, Harriet piped up, and the two boys nodded to her. I, we kind of figured that overhearing Malfoy. The boy named Kieran said, Oh, right. Is that a shillelagh? Hermione asked, looking at Kieran's walking stick. Kieran smiled in an impressed way. And that it is, he said, holding it out to her. She took it, looking at it with scrutiny. Is it magical? She asked curiously. Aye. Scott's cousin made it for me this summer. I don't grow me last walking stick. I can make a Protego charm with it and some others, but I'm not quite up to it yet. It'll also grow with me as I do, and repels dirt in all sorts. Kieran went on excitedly, while Scott looked at it with a little pride. I got me one there, too. It reacted to me. It's a brother of Scott's one, too. Oh, are your family watchmaker or wand makers? Hermione asked. Scott asked Scott, her eyes bright with interest. Scott smiled. Yeah, but I've never been flash about it. But we've never been flash about it like Ollivander is. It's just a family thing for us. And what is a shillelagh, what's it? And how do you, why do you need it anyway? Ronnie asked bluntly. Kieran chuckled. It's a shillelagh. Ancient Irish walking stick and weapon of sorts. And I need this because I got me bum leg. Kieran explained, patting his right leg. I had thought it looked club-like. Yeah, Ronnie said. Hermione piped up again. Well, fascinating as this all is, I've just spoken to the driver and we're going to be there soon. You'd all better get changed, she reiterated. And Harriet watched Ronnie give, give an eye roll out of the corner of her eye as Hermione turned and left the compartment again, looking flustered. Kieran and Scott looked after her, slightly bemused. Well, uh, it was nice meeting you, Harriet and Ronnie, said Scott politely. I will see you around yet, yeah? maybe even in the same house, Kieran said with a hopeful tone. Well, they seem nice, Harriet said after the two boys left. Yeah, good blokes, Ronnie said in agreement. So you'd already met Malfoy? Yeah, and Diagon Alley, going on about how people from Muggle families shouldn't be allowed in Hogwarts. Ronnie glowered. Yeah, I've heard about his family from Dad. Long history of dark wizards there. He'll be in Slytherin. I'll bet you a thousand gallons. Well, if I follow my family lineage, at least I won't be in the same house with him. What house is your family, your lineage? Harriet asked as she drew her ropes from her trunk. Gryffindor? Ronnie answered in a bored voice. Mom and Dad were, Bill was, Charlie was, Percy, Fred, and George are. You get the idea. Anyway, I'm pretty sure it's where I'll end up, but honestly, even Hufflepuff wouldn't, I wouldn't mind compared to Slytherin. It's a pretty nice house, to be honest, if you listen to the actual description of what students in Hufflepuff are like. <laughs> That's what Hagrid said. Harriet replied. Having Ronnie agree with someone as kind-hearted as Hagrid had the effect of cheering Harriet up considerably. Ronnie's apparent quick temper had made her a little worried, but then she reminded herself that perhaps it was more of a chip on her shoulders than outright being easy to anger. It was probably something her brothers, who seemed to have a penchant for teasing her, had played more than one hand in as well. They jumped as a loud, disembodied voice announced the train would be arriving in five minutes. They hurriedly packed away the remainder of the snacks, Ronnie stuffed scabbers back in her pocket, and they joined the other students in the corridor as the train finally came to a halt. Harriet felt as though her whole body had gone numb with nervousness. Ronnie was looking a little green, too. They lurched forward as they finally filed off the train. It was dark already, something she hadn't noticed inside the brightly lit train, but now the night seemed to weigh in on her from all directions. She jumped again when a loud, though friendly voice started calling for the first years. 
She and Ronnie made their way over to the voice, and Harriet beamed, seeing Hagrid's grinning, hairy face as he waved to her. She returned it, drawing many rather impressed looks from the other first years around her, who naturally found Hagrid rather imposing, much as she had when first meeting him, before he turned and called for them all to follow him. They followed warily, going down a steep, winding path. Then the dark trees on either side of them broke, and they saw a lake. A wave of gasps and ohs went through the group. As they all looked up and saw, across the lake from them, its many windows blazing in the night, a castle. So that's Hogwarts, Harry thought to herself. It was more than she'd ever imagined. Ronnie's description had done it no justice. It should have looked foreboding, she reminded herself, but it didn't. Instead, it filled her with a sense of excitement, a sense of adventure, and an odd sense of belonging. I think I'm going to like you here, she thought to herself as they approached the lake. Hagrid shepherded them down to the edge of the lake, where a horde of boats was lined up and waiting. She and Ronnie climbed into one, and to Ronnie's annoyance, so did Hermione and the boy, ne boy Neville, who'd lost his toad. Neville was still sniffling and looking thoroughly miserable. Harriet waved to Kieran and Scott, who were in the boat next to theirs. With a shout, Hagrid had them off, and the vessels seemed to propel themselves after his boat, of which he was the only occupant. Harry grew fainter and fainter as the boats approached the shore. After anticipating the start of the school year for, a whole, for the whole month of August, and despite her initial excitement at finally seeing the castle, Harriet wasn't sure she was quite ready for this. She tilted her head back to keep the school in view as they made it to the cliff before Hagrid called for them all to get down, as they sailed underneath low-hanging rocks and ivy, into a large tunnel. It took them to a small pool where they parked the boats and climbed out. Hey up! Someone there's a toad! Hagrid called curiously. Never excla Neville exclaimed in joy and ran forward, picking up the toad. It's Trevor! He cried and stuck the toad into his pocket as Hagrid smiled down at him and turned with his lamp and turned with his lamp and led them up another passageway onto the grounds of the castle itself. They crossed the grounds and came to a broad set of stone stairs. As Hagrid climbed them and reached the doors, he lifted his giant fist and pounded on the doors once, twice, three times. In an instant, the high doors finally swung open and filled the stairway with light. And with that, ta-da, that ends this cast of, yep, the second chapter of Adventures of Harriet Potter Year One. Close that down there. And now, I guess it's time for us to get ourselves into the behind the scenes. Thank you all for listening, and to all the Patreon donors, uh, enjoy hearing the behind the scenes. <laughs>